Alright, what's going on guys? So today we are at a park in Troy, Michigan. I'm trying to figure out which lenses I should use for the Brenizer method or which one's going to give me the results that I'm looking for. I have brought out my 85mm 1.4, my 70-200 2.8 and I'm going to try a Brenizer with each of them uh, and basically what I'm going to do is kind of use the same controlled results in each one so that I can find out which one's going to give me the most bokeh or you know the best sharpness that kind of thing so that I can decide when I'm actually working you know which one I want to use the most. If you are unaware of the Brenizer method, it's a technique in which you stitch together a series of images like a panoramic, but by using a longer focal length and wide aperture, you achieve a unique look that has a compression and depth of field of a longer lens, but the perspective of a more wide angle lens. I'm going to show you guys and, and talk about how you actually capture one, and as well later I'm going to take you into the post and show you which one's going to give you the best results, and you guys can kind of decide which lens you might want to use for your Brenizer method. Alright, so essentially what you guys are going to see me doing is I'm going to be, on all three lenses, I'm going to be splitting my subject in two. So I'm going to be shooting his top half, shooting his bottom half. From there, I'm flipping over to manual focus, and then I am shooting around the scene to expand it and get more detail. So you'll see me kind of going across and then down, back across, and you're trying to get a lot of coverage so that Photoshop has enough detail to work with to stitch the images together. I'm gonna let you guys kind of just watch me do that as we start off with the 85 millimeter. I'm going to be shooting at 1.4 on this one and we're gonna push it as much as we can on all the shots, so here we go. For camera settings on the Brenizer method, you want to stay in full manual. If you use an automated mode such as Auto ISO or Aperture Priority, you'll get exposure changes that make it difficult to merge the layers in post-production. You auto-focus on your subject for the first image and then flip to manual, or if you're a back button focuser, you just don't re-establish focus. This way, you get the same focal point for all of the images. Right now I've got Chad trying a Brenizer on me. So I just want to show you guys what I think is probably the best way that you can actually shoot these. So what Chad's doing right here, he's actually going to start by shooting me. So he's actually taking a photo of top half of me, then the bottom half. Then he's going to move to the corner of his composition after he flips to manual. He's going to move to the corner and then he's going to shoot across the frame. Now each time he's kind of looking for about 30% coverage just so that Photoshop has quite a bit to work with. Sorry he's going out of focus here but then he's going to lift the camera up on the edge and he's going to work his way right back across. Now I don't do this because I'm an idiot but this is probably the best way that you can shoot your Brenizers and get a lot of stability and if you practice with this you'll be able to do them really really quickly. So now he's moving across the top shooting over my head and coming to the edge of his composition. Just finished up with the 85 millimeter. Now I'm switching to the 70 to 200. I'm actually gonna do two of them with the 70 to 200. First thing I'm gonna shoot at 70 millimeters 2.8, then I'm gonna shoot at 200 millimeters 2.8. And on both of them, I am going to still split Chad right in two and get a photo get two photos just to make up him and then expand the rest of the scene. And I could push it more with 200 millimeters and split him into more images, but for me that's just not practical because people are gonna move a little bit, so I'm gonna stick with splitting in two. I think it's also a fair way to compare the two. So here we go with the 70 to 200. I just finished up with uh, the 70 to 200. Uh, shot it at 70 and at 200 and just from looking at the back uh, compression definitely wins in this instance and 200 millimeters is giving me a lot bigger bokeh looking like it's going to be a battle between the 85 millimeter at 1.4 and the 70 to 200 at 200 um, at f2.8 so definitely going to get a closer look when we uh when we get back in front of the computer and, and see which ones we like better okay guys we have our brenizer images loaded in adobe lightroom 
Now there's a few th reasons that I like to bring my images into Lightroom first, and the primary reason is to get rid of any vignetting within the images. So I just picked a random image. I'm gonna come down here to Lens Corrections. We're going to Enable Profile Corrections, and they've got it built in for my 8514. So as you can see, that entire vignetting on the side is gone. Now the reason we wanna do this is so that Photoshop doesn't have any difficulty with brightness fluctuating between the, between the different images. So this would be the center in my first image, but it may be the edge in the next image. And if there's a dramatic exposure difference, that's gonna make it difficult for Photoshop to actually stitch together. So we wanna make sure that all our vignetting is gone. And we also wanna make sure that our color is even with the, all of them. So you can also take this opportunity to adjust it a little bit. I'm actually gonna warm it up. I'm gonna get rid of this tint and I'm gonna come down here and make a few color adjustments. I'm just gonna make these greens a little bit more of a minty tone. I'm gonna to bring down the luminance of those and then I'm gonna shift over to the yellows, make those a little bit more orange and increase the brightness a little bit. Now we want to sync that with all the images. As you can see on the bottom, I've got all the images selected. So we wanna make sure we're, we are syncing our white balance, we are syncing our color, that way we get those uh, color adjustments we made and also the lens corrections. Now, if you're doing any other type of editing with like exposure or something, you'd wanna make sure that you have those synced. Really, you can just check them all and uh, you won't have to worry about missing anything. So now we have those adjustments synced throughout all the images. So that vignette's gonna be gone in all of them, which is great. So basically now we want to export. So I'm going to right click on the bottom. We're gonna export. Now in here, you can make a little folder of the images, rename, whatever you typically do. I'm gonna be working with 3000 pixel long edge JPEG files, and I got them at about 80% quality just for the purpose of the video. Now, if you think about it, you're gonna be stitching together a lot of images, so you really don't need the file to be gigantic if you're just going to be using them for web. But if you're gonna be using them for print, you might want to keep all the pixels you have. I could have this up to 6,000, which is probably what they're natively shot at. But since I'm not doing anything with these files, I'm going to be using 3,000. Just keep in mind that you know, you're gonna be stitching these together and if you have four rows of 3,000 pixels with 30% coverage, you're still gonna have over 8,000 pixels of height. So it's gonna be a gigantic file. And the bigger your files are, the longer that's gonna take. So we're gonna stick with 3,000 and we're gonna hit export. Now, I've already got these done so I can show you, but now we'd be waiting on exporting, but we're gonna flip into Photoshop since I already have them done. And I'm gonna show you how to stitch them together here. We're gonna go from file, automate, photo merge. We're going to browse those files, go to that folder that we just made. We're going to select all of those, hit OK. It's going to load them in this little launcher right here. I just use auto for the perspective, and it generally does a good job from there. So it's going to load up, go through all the different files, and begin stitching them together. Now this is gonna take a while, it's gonna take longer depending on your image size and the speed of your computer, especially this part when it's aligning the different layers. So my computer is actually pretty strong, it doesn't take too long, but we're going to fast forward through this just so you guys don't have to watch my loading screen. All right guys, you can see we have our file now. As you can see, there was a little bit of an issue when lining up the subject's face. Basically that occurred because there were too many photos that featured the subject's head and it had to make a decision. Now all I did to get rid of that is bring in one of the clean files of his head and clone stamped out the area around his head so that it fit in pretty seamlessly. Go ahead and crop, clear my aspect ratio. So basically now I'm just going to crop to each edge And I kind of want him centered, so maybe we'll do... <clears throat> I want him centered, so we're going to keep him right about there. Lower this a little bit. And a lot of times, if you want this to be a little bit larger or something like that, these are really easy since they're out of focus to just go back in and clone stamp any little areas. Like if I wanted this to be lower right here. I could definitely include that little portion down there. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to flatten it. You'll see there's all these little kind of jagged lines when we show it. But if we flatten it, all that will disappear because it actually is blended. So we're going to go ahead and flatten that. And just to show you guys really quickly how you can get rid of some of these problem areas, we're just going to select that one. I'm hitting Shift F5, which brings up the fill menu. I'm going to go content aware and boom, it's pretty much good, undetectable, especially on such a large image. And there's also this corner over here. We're going to use a polygonal lasso tool and select that area. And we are also going to content aware fill that. And that's pretty nice. Filled up those corners really nicely. There's also this one over here too, a little bit. Okay guys, now we have all three of them completed and opened up in Photoshop. So I'm gonna take you through a quick look at the different files and show you the different characteristics that we're getting from using the different lenses. First off, I wanna show you the 70 millimeter on the 72.8. Another little issue with the face here, not a huge one. Uh, I could definitely fix that with the clean head again, but just something I noticed definitely need to watch that coverage of the head as you're going past it. So the bokeh on the 70 to 200 millimeter at 70 millimeters 2.8 is definitely the smallest of our three. And if we look at maybe the 85, it is much larger, much, much larger. It's also a little bit, uh, I don't know, just the look to it. It's a little bit more flat. Uh, with the 70 so I would not suggest the 70 millimeter at all I thought that maybe by getting closer and having a little bit more background separation that there's a chance that it would give me about equal results but it's definitely nowhere close so if you want a quick look at the full shot as you can see there's just tons of detail I have no plans to use 70 millimeters in the future for any attempts at brandizer so I'm just going to go ahead and close that and we're going to bring open the two big candidates. We've got the 85 right here, and now I'm flipping over to the 200 millimeter at 2.8. And I think that the 200 millimeter just has so much more Christmas to the actual subject. I think the detail in his face is a lot, lot better. I got a lot more chromatic aberration, um, just looks a little bit soft overall, and I keep my lenses pretty well calibrated, so I don't think that was an issue. It's just, I think, shooting at 1.4 versus 2.8. Now, if we zoom out, they're about the same bokeh size, but if you notice on the 200, it's a much rounder shape versus the 85, which kind of gave us these ovals of bokeh. So I'm gonna zoom out on both of them. All right, so now if we compare, it's definitely a more compressed version with the 200 millimeter. This is the 200 millimeter that we're on right now. Uh, pretty cool look overall, and I really like how big the circles of bokeh are. They're very, very crisp. And as I said, with the 200 millimeter, we could have taken it a step further and actually you know, chunked the subject into more pieces if we wanted to. So this wasn't even as far as you could take the 200 millimeter and we got a really cool result. Now the 85, I was pretty much as close as I could get while still you know, cutting him in two. Maybe I could have gotten um, a little bit closer, but I think this was about as far as I'd wanna push it on the 85. So I like, I like how the bokeh looks. Uh, I think it's a little bit bigger, a little bit creamier, uh, a little bit, a little bit more surreal of a look with the 85 millimeter 1.4 and a little bit more realism while still having that separation on the 200 millimeter. So if I'm coming back to this, I'll probably actually use the 85 millimeter, even though I like the shape of the 200 millimeter at 2.8 better on the bokeh. I just think when I'm looking at the full image that it just looks a little bit dreamier, more of that surreal look that I am looking for when I use this technique. All right, so I'm gonna end it right there. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what lens you're going to be using for your brandizers, or if you have any questions in terms of how to capture them based off the video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Please, if you enjoy the video, hit that like button, subscribe for more. Let me know what you guys wanna see. I'm doing all sorts of tutorial videos right now and I'd really like to connect with you guys and get out some cool content for you to learn from. Have a good one, YouTube.